God, we thank you for the word that you have given us. We ask through the power of the Holy Spirit that you open the eyes of our heart, that we may love Jesus evermore and follow him evermore. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you have ever seen the poster, the sign that says, all I, really to, all I really needed to know, I learned in kindergarten? Are you familiar with that one? There's, there's a, a poster sign. I'm just going to read you some of the things. All I, really need, all I really needed to know, I learned in kindergarten. Here's a couple things. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that are yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. Take a nap every afternoon. I thought you might like that last one there. <laughs> that, that lesson from kindergarten kind of came back. Do you remember the mats? I had a mat, you know, we had to take that nap. How many pretended to sleep? Okay. But these are nice rules, aren't they? And they are there to remind us to maybe pause for a moment, to reassess some of the things that we're doing. And sometimes parents also encourage these things, right? Share, don't hit, put things back. They encourage these things to help you live a fruitful life, at least according to worldly wisdom, right? So these are some good things. But where do we find the wisdom that's needed to live a godly life? Where do we find God's wisdom about living the life that he desires us to live? Of the encouragement to be both faithful and bold. Where do we find that? His word, right? We find that in his word, and we find that in Paul's second letter to Timothy. Remember, Paul is encouraging Timothy to persevere in the gospel, to keep standing firm for the gospel, no matter the circumstances, even if the culture is problematic, even if there are problems within the church. And so he encourages, Paul encourages Timothy. And today we're going to take a look at two forms of encouragement. The two forms are to be a worker approved by God and to be a vessel for honorable use. Now in the section that we have, the text that we have from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14 through 26, Paul actually gives some do's and don'ts. So as we go through here, we're going to cover some do's and don'ts to make it very simple. But in all of this, it's to be encouraged. So let's start with a worker approved by God. Verse 14 and 15. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed rightly handling the word of truth. So first we're going to focus on the do's, then we'll get to the don'ts. The do's here. The first one is to remind them, to remind the men and women to be faithful to the gospel. Make sure people remember the very gospel that they were given. And this word remind isn't just a casual word, it's a command. Paul is basically saying, Timothy, make sure that people know the gospel and have it be the main thing. Basically, seeing, he's saying, keep the main thing the main thing and don't veer off course. You know, how many of you have been driving? You're driving along and all of a sudden, ooh, garage sale! Pull over. Fishing boat. Pull over. Or whatever it might be for you, right? And for some people, when they're driving like that, and you, you, you might be one of them, or you might have been in the car with one of them. You kind of go, whoa! And, you know, they veer off, and they get back on course a little bit. Sometimes people veer off 
too far and they have an accident, sometimes not serious, but sometimes it's fatal. And what do driving instructors always tell you? Keep your eyes on the road. Paul is telling Timothy, keep your eyes on the gospel. Have the people remember the gospel. Have it soak into their lives. So it fills them completely. And so you and I should never get tired of the gospel message. We, do, we hear it again and again, both in song and word and even in deed. Now this morning, the first song was a gospel message song, whether you realized it or not. Second, second verse we sang, it tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how, he lo how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Keep the main thing, the main thing, right? The love of Christ Jesus, the gospel message. Now, the second thing he tells them, tells Timothy, is do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Now, if you recall, last week we talked about what it means to be a soldier. We covered that, what it means to be a soldier, an athlete, a farmer. And all of those three things there's a lot of devotion, there's a lot of discipline, there's a lot of hard work that goes into all of those three things, right? And to follow Christ Jesus means that there is some effort that you put into it, that it's just not a passive thing, but you are actively engaged. You know, Oswald Chambers, I don't know if you know him, but there's a, a devotional, and it's called My Utmost for his highest. And I think that really talks about what Paul is writing to Timothy about. My utmost for his highest. It is do your best. Leave nothing behind. He has told Timothy, you've got gifts. Use them fully. Run that race, right? Be the soldier, be the farmer. Do all of that work. Leave nothing behind. Now I have to put in here that all of that work, all of that effort is not to gain God's favor. We don't do all of that to say that God will love me more. That I'll be somehow more saved. It doesn't work that way. You know, we, we've been talking about in Galatians the balance scale, right? I hope I've done enough good things to outweigh the bad things. That's not what we're talking about here. Look, there's only one person who is perfect and perfectly good, and his name is Jesus. So we rest in his grace, and at the same time, we do the work because... Oh, how, everybody, oh, how I love Jesus. Come on. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. That's why we do our best. Because we love Jesus. And we should do our best in a way that we are never ashamed. You see, the call to follow Jesus is a call to be holy as he who called you is holy. If you want to cross-reference that, just take a look at 1 Peter chapter 1. As a pastor, Timothy has a special call. It is a call to be the spiritual leader, to preach and to teach, to shepherd the flock. And this is a call that no pastor should ever take lightly. James writes this, Not many of you, should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Thus, all pastors are called to live a life that is separate, that is holy 
unto the Lord, because that is what God commands. The problem is, every pastor, we're sinners who are saved by grace. And there are pastors, unfortunately, and they're in the news all, every year, there's a couple high-profile pastors who fall from grace. And then what does the world do? They go, aha, oh, ho, you hypocrite, you are a false Christian anyway. That Christianity, Christianity thing is just a bunch of baloney. But even worse, members of the congregation look at the pastor who has fallen from grace and they go, well, I guess it really is fake. And so they leave the faith. See, you don't put your faith in the pastor. The pastor's role is to point you to the one in whom you are to have faith. Many people follow the pastor. But you know what? I tell people, and I tell people this all the time, I'm a pointer dog. I point to Jesus Christ. So any pastor that you follow, so to speak, should keep pointing you to Jesus. And that's what he's telling them here. And that he shouldn't be ashamed. Now, does this apply only to pastors? It doesn't. I mean, we're all called to live that life because, quite frankly, people are going to take a look at you to see if Christianity is true. You might be the only gospel, the only Bible, so to speak, that people read. And so you are called to be that way as well. We are all called for this. And finally, Paul says to rightly handling the word of truth. He tells Timothy he's, he needs to be a worker rightly handling the word of truth. One of the most precious things that God has given us is his word. And we need to hold that dearly, right? It is precious to us, and we need to treat it as something precious. It means that we don't bend, shape, or warp the word to meet our own particular desires. We are to rightly handle that word. What does it say? What does it mean? How does it apply to us? Those three things, right? What does it say? What does it mean? How does it apply to us? Any pastor should do expository preaching. So let me explain this. Expository. Expository simply means to explain. Okay? That's it. To explain. But it is to explain with the proper grammar, context, history. You can't just pluck things out for your own desires. As a matter of fact, a good expository preacher is shaped by the text rather than shaping the text to fit their own personal desires. Okay, so let me give you an example of this. Last week, when week before, we, we covered that God has given us not a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Do you remember that? Okay, this word power in the Greek is dynamis. It's the word that we use for dynamite. Now, what does it mean in the Greek? It means power. Okay, now I'm going to say how somebody could warp this and use it for their own devices. This is a fake sermon. Okay, God has given you a spirit of power. And that power is the word we get for dynamite. So God has given you a dynamite explosive faith. And anything, if you just light the fuse of your faith, it will blow it out of the way. If you have difficulty in financial situations, use your dynamite power and it will blow it out of the water. If you're having relationship issues, use that dynamite power and it will blow it away. Anything that stands in your way, you have that dynamite power of God in you. You get the point, right? 
And if I went on, I would make myself sick. Because that is a true warping of the meaning. And you would find that in the, what they call the word of faith movement. The name it and claim it, or derogatorily, blab it and grab it. So you need to rightly use the word. You need to maintain fidelity to it. And when you are doing these things, then you are a worker approved by God. So those are the do's. Let's go to the don'ts. This is uh, verse 14, then 16 through 18. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. But avoid irreverent babble, for it would lead people into more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. Okay, two things to avoid. A quarrel about words. Uh, I'm going to guess you might know people who like to argue and certainly argue about theology. Like there's the very silly question, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? I'm going to give you my answer. I don't care. Really? I mean, what has that to do with anything? It has to do with nothing. But here's, here's a real one. Actually, that one is real for some people. But end times. When's the end going to come? Is it going to be premillennial, amillennial, postmillennial? And if you don't even know those words, that's fine. I'm going to tell you I'm amillennial. I'm panmillennial. I think it'll all pan out in the end. Yeah, okay. I trust God in all of his timing. Was that a bad joke? That was a bad joke. All right. But, but I, I simply trust God in all of his timing. Some things are not clear, but there are people who spend their entire ministries trying to sift the tea leaves, so to speak, and say, oh, well, this thing that happened in Israel corresponds to this verse in Revelation, and that must also mean that America is... I mean, they, they have full ministries like that, and that's all the time they really spend on. But I'm thinking... There's work right in front of us here. There are people that we know that don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They don't know the gospel. Those are our neighbors. They need to hear the message now. There are people who are hungry. There are people who need clothing. There are people who need care. They need that now. So don't get involved in all those quarrel of words. The other thing here is that Paul says, avoid irreverent babble. The literal word for irreverent is profane. So these are people who speculate that Jesus did not die, that he didn't rise from the dead. And this would be consistent with Islam. It would be consistent uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. They would fall within that category. It would certainly be consistent with many of the so-called progressive churches. Paul specifically calls out two people here, Hymenius Hymenius and Philetus. And they're putting forth the lie that the resurrection has already happened. In essence, it was a spiritual resurrection. There's no bodily resurrection. Now, how important is a bodily resurrection in our faith? It is crucial in our faith. It is not some little side road. Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. 
look, there are some conversations that start to weave its way into churches, and it infects the churches like gangrene. We don't deal much with gangrene, but I bet you know of somebody who's had sepsis in the hospital. It infects their whole body, and it kills the person unless severe measures are taken. So we need to avoid those conversations because they really do start to infect the body. So be a worker, approved by God, and today we're also going to focus on being an honorable vessel, a vessel for honorable use. Verse 20 and 21 now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, and some honorable, honorable vessels, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So let's talk about it this way. How many of you have that special set of dishes? You maybe inherited them from your grandmother, your grandmother's grandmother, and they are the special dishes that only come out on special occasions, right? And they are you, the, those are the good ones, and you treat them gently, and you put the, and that's where you also serve the good food. There's not like a McDonald's hamburger on that plate. This is a good meal, right? But there are also, quite frankly, you probably have some chip plates, or maybe the Tupperware that's been in the microwave a little too long and bubbled up at the bottom, right? You know, and you use that for mixing paint or other projects around the house, right? Those are the dishonorable vessels. You wouldn't use them. But Paul's talking about something even more than that. And I'm going to show you a picture and see if you recognize it. It's a chamber pot. So back in Paul's day, and really not that long ago, really, chamber pots were used throughout the world and in many cases still are, I would say that would be a vessel of dishonorable use. And you would never clean your good dishes with water from, right? That's, okay, good. You get how repulsive that is. I want you to keep that idea of how repulsive that is because that's kind of what we're getting at here. It is truly repulsive. See, you and I are to be vessels of honor, the good dishes, because you and I are set apart for the special work of God. So let's take that metaphor and start to apply it now. So an honorable vessel carries certain things. And an honorable vessel carries God's word, his truth, and everything that it implies. An honorable, honorable vessel shares the gospel, carries the gospel at all times, shares about the love, the grace, the forgiveness of sins that we have in Christ Jesus. This is an honorable vessel. A dishonorable vessel, however, carries a message that warps God's word that is false and that leads many people away from Jesus and more. So we're going to deal a little bit with the dishonorable vessel first. So ultimately, a dishonorable vessel will glorify man and not glorify God. It'll all be man-centered. I gave you the example, by the way, of that dynamite, right? That glorified who? It glorified man. It did not glorify Jesus. There was no Jesus in there. It was all about what you could get. That's called the Word of Faith movement. You will also find the prosperity gospel in here. Now, I'm going to give you one that most people might not think about, but it's called easy believism. Easy believism. 
says that God does not care about what we say, what we do, how we act, as long as we love God. As long as we can say, oh, uh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, and then we can do any particular act that we want, it really doesn't matter, right? That's called easy believism. Now, you might think, does that really play out in our society? Oh, you bet. I am going to read you just a couple sentences from an article. It just came out last week. I triple-checked it to see if it was true. It's true. Angela Dela Cruz is a porn star. She is also a pastor of Living Faith Church, a new church plant in downtown San Diego. Angela and her husband, Stephen Dela Cruz, launched the church plant this summer, advertising it as a church for sinners by sinners. The church website further explains that the church's leaders are the biggest sinners and this is the most non judgmental church around. Look, there's more to it. As a matter of fact, if you look on their website and what they believe, it looks fairly orthodox. They cover up what is dishonorable. But is Jesus fooled by any of this? No, not at all. He is not fooled. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty, many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And we find that in our reading too. That God knows who are his own. Look, even if you take even if you take a chamber pot and put a lot of flowers and other things on it, it's still a chamber pot, pot isn't it? It still is dishonorable use. So Paul tells Timothy this. He says, so flee youthful passions. And this is a command, right? He says, flee and keep on fleeing, right? It's not just run once. It is continually run away from these youthful passions. Now, the youthful passions, you just think about your own youth, right? It could be uh, impatience, anger, arrogance. It could be impetuousness, disregard for wisdom, sensuality, and so forth. It could be a lot of those things. The trouble with our culture is we don't appreciate age anymore. Everybody's got to be young, 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 young. As a matter of fact, we just watched a commercial last night when you have a bunch of adults around a table and they're speaking in little kid voices about the candy they liked. As, as, it's like, really? Is this what age has to be? Aren't we to age gracefully? And by the way, when I say age gracefully, I don't mean not having a full life, not being active. I include all of that. I'd like you to consider something else about aging gracefully, that we grow fully in grace. That we grow in grace as we mature. Now that you are in Christ, mature in his grace. Be a vessel of honor. One person put it this way, cleanse yourself of all that is false and worldly. Desire to be made holy to love God's word and prayer and to be useful in the master's service. So how do you be a vessel of honor? Well, this is what Paul writes. He says, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with all those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Just as he says, flee youthful passions, he says, pursue. And this pursue is a command. And you are to continually pursue certain things. A lot of people have that easy believism, 
have a very passive faith. We are to have an active faith. And this pursue has the sense almost like uh, we talked about before about running the race, you know, of running that race of faith, of pursuing these particular things. And he gives four particular aspects. We are to pursue righteousness. Now, what is righteousness? Righteousness is what God has declared right. And so we know that through his word. If you ever want to know what is righteousness, well, Paul writes about it here. Just read Ephesians chapter 4. Actually, read all of Ephesians. It's not that long. You will find out what it means to pursue righteousness. And the interesting thing is, once you pursue his righteousness, you want more. And you start saying, oh, how I love Jesus. Because he is the righteousness of God. And then we are also to pursue faith. To continually to develop our faith in both word and deed. It's not, so Bible study, his word is important, and then we are to live that out. Re, again, read the letter from James. We are to have a faith that is alive and active. And we're to pursue that. Not just kind of watch it, by, watch it go by, but to pursue it. And then love. Oh, how I love Jesus, right? And how did he love us? With a self-sacrificial love of giving yourself to another, of giving yourself completely, of taking up your cross, dying to self, loving Christ, loving another. Pursue love. And also pursue peace. Now Jesus is known as the Prince of Peace. He has a peace because there is full harmony and unity with God the Father and the Holy, God the Holy Spirit. The Trinity, right? Perfect harmony, perfect unity, perfect peace. And he said, my peace, I leave you. Not from the world, but from him. And so we need to spend time with Jesus because he is the source of our peace. So what does pursuing mean in that? It might mean just quiet time. Quiet time sometime during the day. Put everything else away. And you sit at the foot of the cross. Just being with him. Thanking him. These are things you are to pursue. See, when you're cleansed by his blood, when you're set apart for a vessel of honor and you fill yourself up by pursuing righteousness and faith and love and peace, do you know what song you sing? Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. This is the encouragement that we have this morning. Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you have made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So this week, I'm going to start with the don'ts, okay? Don't engage in ungodly babble and teaching. Don't be a chamber pot. So you might have to reset some priorities in your life. Here's what to do. Do your best to present yourself before God as a worker approved and be a vessel for honorable use, serving our Lord and Savior. And everyone says, amen.